<laughs> Yo. Chill, robot. All right, here we are. We've made it through to the next level. Day two of Cine 230 Remix Cultures. You are here. I'm here. I'm back in the barn. It's raining out. And we got a tin roof up on this piece, so um, be prepared for some tingling, bing, bing, rat-a-tat from the ceiling down. But, you know, it is, it is what it is. You know, it's a pandemic, y'all. You know, I got that excuse. So, uh, anyways, hope you're well. Hope you're doing all right. Hope you're healthy. Uh, hope, hope you're still here with us. Um, just make sure that, you know, you went through the things to do before class, before you get into this module. Um, it'll be helpful. It's pretty, pretty minimal. Read a comic book, review, re-review. Um, everything is a remix, which we'll, which we'll talk about now. Um, but we're going to go over intellectual property basics, right? This is like, uh, today's going to be the philosophy of ideas or ideas about um, ideas. So, uh, you can follow along, check out the IP basics uh, slides, which is kind of what I'm going to be ripping on today and going from today. I also want to apologize if I say like or um a lot. Uh, once I get into my groove, maybe I'll uh, <clears throat> dip away from that, but it's just, you know, it's part of the awkwardness of just sitting here alone in my bar and talking to a camera. Usually I'm here alone in the bar and talking to myself or the ghost of George, who is the person who lived here and spent billions of hours in here building ships. I'll show you my ship at some point. Um, but anyways, we're chilling with uh, Caspian, the dog um, from Redwood, little Shogun warrior in the house, you know, um, and, and you. So anyway, so we're going to get into this. Um, I usually like to take this point in the class to ask people to define culture. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of ways to think about it, uh, anthropologically, um, you know, uh, identity-wise, uh, socially, etc. I mean, but, you know, I kind of want you just to think about, like, what is culture? What does it mean to you? You know, and you come up with all sorts of definitions. But I, I think just, you know, the, the best way to sort of think about it is, you know, shared values, shared beliefs, shared languages, shared arts by groups of, of people, shared ways of communicating, um, what have you. And it's shared by a group of people. Uh, you know, and this used to be more of a re like regionally defined, um, you know, uh, defined by ethnicity, uh, defined by um, religion, uh, everything, you know. Um, but I mean, culture's just so much broader now, uh, just because of the internet, just because everything, um, you know, is less geographically based and more based on the World Wide Web in, in so many ways. So just think about, you know, what does culture mean to you? And we can, you know, that's my, my general definition. Then I like to ask, what is, what is a remix, you know? <clears throat> and this is maybe an easier thing to define or maybe a harder thing. Um, but I, I think the simplest way, if you look kind of at what Kirby said and maybe think about some of the things you like and enjoy that it's the combo, it's a remix is a combination of things, usually older things that, um, you know, um, are made relevant for the present, you know, whether that's technology or things like movies or, or music. Um, but it can be like, you know, viral cat mashup videos or memes or whatever. Okay. And then I like to ask, what is intellectual property? Now, this is maybe the one that you've never thought about. You give two fucks about. You've never, you've never had a reason to ever think about this. Um, but, I mean, the way we can just think about it is if you think about property, right? If you think of actual physical, <clears throat> physical property, right? This is mine. This is my coffee mug. You know, this is my hat, you know, or if you think of land, you know, um, people think, you know, when they own land and in many ways, you know, you own from the ground up through the sky, um, you know, but intellectual property is basically extending the logic of property, of, of, of sovereign individual ownership, uh, exclusivity, um, you know, exclusive access, etc., to a hat or a cup of coffee or to prop physical property, land, um, you know, to the realm of ideas, to 
the realm of light to the realm of fire. And I, I hope you kind of get that, that Thomas Jefferson and that, that analogy, what Kirby calls a meme, um, you know, when we're talking about fire and light, right? Like, so how do you take something, you know, like fire and light, something that's uncontainable, and, and how do you make it like something that is, is a rivalrous good? So I take this sip of coffee. You can't have that, that sip of coffee, right? It no longer exists um, in, that, in, in, in that cup. How do you extend that logic to ideas, right? The idea still exists even when you consume it, the original idea. Or the fire still exists, your original lit candle st still exists. So intellectual property is just really just how do you take, you know, um, the logic of the physical world of goods, of, of property, and apply it to what comes from here and shoots out onto paper or out onto film or, um, you know, into a piece of technology or something like that. Okay, that's just kind of a way to kind of think about all that stuff. I always like to ask too, you know, is law culture, right? Because this is not a law class. Please remember, this is not a law class. Sorry if I'm going to start getting Bernie, Bernie talking with it with my hands, but uh, uh, this is not a law class. We're looking at legal culture, but is law culture, you know? And I think if we kind of look at our definition, you know, or any definition of culture, hell yeah, it's culture. Um, if you look at the, how laws are passed, I mean, we're watching it live on TV right now. Um, you know, how laws are passed. Um, you know, this whole culture of Congress, this whole, le you know, legal and governmental culture. Um, and then we see corporations creep kind of into that, into that realm, you know, lobbyists, et, et cetera. So, of course, there's a legal culture. There's a culture of, of judges and adjudication and, um, you know, court hearings and passing bills and passing bills into laws and you know all that all that stuff of course there is a culture around law so when we look at remix culture it's the combination of legal culture okay the, the culture of law and then corporate culture now we see you know in Kirby's everything is a remix that the largest remixers are companies uh, big companies, Disney specifically, I'm going to hate on Disney a lot for this throughout the term, but Disney is, you know, the primary exemplary company of, uh, of you know, of, of a remix company, but corporations are a major part of this. They make the technologies that we use to manipulate the texts that corporations make, meaning like I buy a sampler and then that allows me, made by a corporation, I buy that sampler, that allows me to sample from other people's music that is also put out by, by a corporation. It allows you to mod video games, you know, allows for all this stuff. But there is a total, you know, um, other than that, a total corporate culture. If you think of the culture of the corporation, how it exists, that its primary and only goal is to turn a profit on behalf of its stockholders, which is all by law that a corporation must do. And there's a certain culture um, around corporations, which we're, we're, we're seeing right now play out um, in, in the news, you know, asking for handouts, um, you know, uh, all that stuff. But I mean, when we talk about how corporations interact with legal culture, it's very directly and it's often um, through lobbying. So not only are corporations the greatest remixers, but they also help to make the laws. They lobby to pass the laws that guide how things are remixed and the rules around remixing. Then there's the mass culture, the popular culture. There's subcultures and there's folk cultures, right? And these are, this is basically us, 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 us peasants, um, us consumers, right? Um, and we take things that come from the corporate culture, the technologies and the texts, right, that are important to us and we make new things out of them. Now, um, how corporations react to that is in a couple ways. Number one, they'll often incorporate our ideas into their new technologies and new texts, um, our storylines, our sub-stories, our innovations, um, with what we do with their things. They, they'll include that into their, you know, um, into their texts, their, to their technologies. Um, they often react to us, or they may see what we're doing with their stuff, and they may sue us, and then we react to that by doing something different, by masking what we're doing better, by being more anonymous, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we're always doing stuff. We're always innovating, us people, right, us human beings. So this, in between all of this, 
Sorry, homie. Uh, in between all of this is remix culture. In the poop brown middle of the Venn diagram is, is remix culture. It's the collision of all these things, how we react to legal culture, how we act to corporations, um, you know, how we interact with their technologies and their texts. You know, um, that is remix culture. It's the center, the vortex uh, of all this stuff. And that's kind of like what we'll be looking at through, throughout this term is the, the triad of all these, all these cultures. Okay. So we watched Everything is Remixed by Kirby. Now, you may think what he had to say was bullpucky, you know, total crap. Um, you may have been like, wow, I didn't know, like, these people, these texts that I enjoyed. So, you know, Star Wars was, like, influenced in these ways. Now, it's not crazy direct sampling or complete appropriation that George Lucas did, but it was being influenced by the things that, that, that's around him, yet claiming to be you know, an uninfluenced individual genius or, or creator, which is sort of the, the flaw in the ideology behind ownership, is that there's a singular author, a singular genius, when in fact, you know, there's a whole team, a grip of people who made Star Wars. You know, there's always a whole team of people, but one person or one entity, usually a company, gets the credit as the, as the author. So, I don't know, like, everything is remix. I mean, is it fair to say that? It's hard, it's hard to see like a truly original idea. I mean, it's 2020. Show me one. Show me something that is not influenced by the past. Because I'll be fucking impressed as hell. I want to know. I'm, I, I've listened to crazy music, mad music, right? I've never heard an original musical idea. Just I've never heard one. It's been done, you, you know what I'm saying? So, I don't know. I kind of buy into the buy into thing, but within that... Like, where is originality, right? Like, where is it? It's in how well you take the past and you flip it for the present. How you innovate with it. What you do with the clay of the past, how you mold it into the art of the future, I think, is, is the important thing. So, you know, I want you to think, like, have you ever made a remix? Hmm. Sorry, I just flipped you off, but I was itching my eye. I got into some poison oak the other day uh, with my chainsaw, so excuse me if I, if I itch and scratch a, a bit. But uh, anyways, um, I mean, have you ever made a remix? Ever? Chances are you have. You do it all the time, consciously, unconsciously. You've never probably thought of something like writing a paper um, for one of your classes as a remix, but you're quoting people, you're paraphrasing, you're bringing in your own salt and pepper, you're shaking it all up, and, and you put it out in a different in a different way. So of course, yeah, you've you've remixed stuff before, um, and I mean, I think everything you use, phones, computers, all these things that are sort of at the center, the technologies at the center of your daily lives, are all influenced by the past. They're all the byproducts of of remixing. If you look at Kirby's whole delinea uh, delineation of the history of computing technology. I mean, that's all, you know, uh, borrow and remix and then put out to the world in a, in a different way. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like, that's the thing. That's not, that's not bad. It's actually really good because um, it's how we get better things. We get more efficient uh, products. Mm. So, I mean, one way I like to think about his thesis of copy, transform, and combine is for anybody out there who plays a musical instrument, right? You play a musical instrument, right? What do you, how do you learn to play a musical instrument? Do you just, you know, pick up a guitar or get on the piano and start writing your own melodies? I mean, maybe, right? Like if you're like a, a musical prodigy, but it's highly unlikely, right? So what do you first play? Other people's music, you learn how to play the classics. Like you learn how to play, you know, all the classic songs and that's where you start, you know? I mean, that's, that's where you start, you know? Once you get a little bit more proficient in playing other people's music, then you move on to kind of like playing with it, right? The melodies, you start to tweak, you start to rearrange things, you start to add your own lyrics to the lyrics, you know, you start to change stuff. You start to transform what you've copied, right? And then sort of your next level of musicianship is when you're combining, when this is all like coming together, right? Like all the past of all the songs that you've learned how to play, how you've tweaked them, how you've adapted them, and now you're combining all that in writing your own music and making your own music, but it's still influenced by what you copied. 
by what you've played, you know. So that, I think that's kind of a, you know, pretty decent um, hypothesis for like how we learn how to create. Like you learn how to make films by like first starting when you're younger, like imitating ads or reshooting scenes uh, for movies that you really like or whatever with your friends, you know what I mean? So, uh, or you're like, you're building plain model kits, right? Like you're copying, using directions and you're putting things together. I mean, just any, any of that sort of stuff. And then you get better at making model planes and you start to make your own types of planes. I mean, it just kind of is, is, is how we learn how to innovate as humans. So a couple things from um, his, his text that I think is valuable, at least the film that I, that I want you to think about is, you know, um, people had ideas for a long time, right? We, we gave ideas, we made art, we made technologies, and they were given to the publics. They were given to the public domain. They were the property of society. And why did people innovate early on? Multiple reasons, like you needed some, some shit that worked good. Um, you wanted to make art, you know, cause you, you worked, you farmed all day long and goddamn, you know, you got home from farming for 15 hours and you want to make some music, you know? But it wasn't necessarily about money, you know, and people were innovating, creating, making stuff. And then once you start to have the market economy where people to come together and exchange goods and services specifically for money, right, then you start to change how you think about creating art and ideas and, and, and putting, them, putting them out there. So you start to have this concept of the public domain, making art and technology because it benefits society and that's why you do it. And then maybe it benefits you in the, the act of creation. And then we move as we move into industrialization and, and the market world to privatization where, where these ideas become property where they become the, the creations of individuals, right? For a long time, we were tribal, you know. Um, we, we made things in our groups of people. You know, we came up with innovations because we needed, we needed them um, to survive, you know. And if we came up with something that, you know, benefited our group, it, it, it was good, right? But as time went on, obviously, we started to recognize ourselves as individuals, as important individuals, you know, and that changes how we view what we create and, and how we create it. Okay. He has this concept of ideas as dank memes, right? Like if you think about a meme, your favorite meme, maybe Baby Yoda, uh, maybe some uh, Takeshi 6 9 whatever it is, you know, dank memes spread. You know, they, they spread and, and, and they turn into new memes, right? Um, and, and the memes get remixed and they get appropriated. And you don't ever have the person who originated the meme asking for credit, suing other people for it, right? Like, that just does not exist in meme culture. And that's really the nature or the ontology or whatever you want to call it of ideas. Is good ideas, they want to spread. If we think of, of fire, Right? Like the fire, do, fire does not want to be contained, right? It wants to burn everything up, right? It wants to burn the field, you know what I'm saying? And so, um, you know, but we try to contain it, right? We try to contain it as, as property. We try to make it exclusive. We try to make it scarce, right? When I light your candle from mine, from mine and you not light your neighbor's or your mom's candle from, from yours, you, you, still have, you still have light. Right. And so when you have things like ideas that are just like light, their nature is just like light. You need intellectual property laws to make them artificially scarce, to make them like physical property. OK. Um, and that's pretty important. That's an important concept to grab here. Uh, he also talks about loss aversion. And you want to know this for the test. Right. This is this. We love to copy right? We are down to copy. We are down to torrent stuff. We are down to bite. We are down to take and flip. We are down for that, right? Until somebody does it to us, right? I mean, come on, right? Like it feels real good to get something for free or to take something and to adapt it. And Steve Jobs, yo, he said like, we're shameless about copying. Apple's shameless about it. And then you know, years later, he's about to go thermonuclear war on, 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 on Android, you know, and so, I mean, that, that, that's the thing. You experience loss aversion, meaning, like, it feels good to copy or feels good to do something until that thing is done to you, and then you feel like you've, 
you've lost something. And when you lose your precious, you get mad. Okay, and we'll go over many, many examples of this throughout the term. The Walt Disney Company and Walt Disney with Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. Um, you know, he, he gets into like Shepard Fairey and Apple as other examples. And then sample and patent trolls. We'll get into sample and patent trolls as we, as we move along in the term, but these are basically a sample troll is someone that buys catalogs of music with no concept or no intention of licensing or selling or making new music, but just suing people for sampling and appropriating, appropriating that music. The same for patents. You have these shell companies that buy basically junk patents or, or broad patents that don't have a lot of money unto themselves. They're not that valuable except for the fact that they are patented, which means you can exclude others from using those ideas and technologies. Um, and those patent trolls will sue anybody who kind of lightly steps on, on their patent, um, you know, and that's their business. They don't innovate or make anything or file for new patents or, or invent or anything. They just sue people for um, treading on their, on their patent. So that's some of the concepts from everything as a remix. You can see um, some of my favorite memes is the crying Jordan me and I love it. Um, especially the James Harden beard one that gets me. And uh, you know, here, yo, the cat, classic. And of course, the Takeshi 6 uh, rat ratting out. Um, I should include the baby Yoda because the baby Yoda's uh, uh, real good. But this is just, you know, some classic memes, right? And these people who make these memes don't look for credit. They don't look to sue, right? They let the good ideas spread and influence others, you know? And then new memes are, are created, sorry, homie, are created based upon those, okay? Okay, we're gonna take a little bit of break here. I know I've been babble-labbling for a minute, so let's take a little break. You can take a nap. Uh, chew on this stuff for a minute. You want to kind of have some of these concepts down for the first exam uh, for sure. Okay, so just take a moment, take a break, and we'll be back, um, you know, after this commercial.